Good morning. I'm glad you're here. Hope you're enjoying the weather. I love this time of year. I love the 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 the, the Christmas of the air and and going to bed with the comforter way up high and then the the whoosh hearing my air conditioner turn on reminding me that it's not really that cold after all. And uh, last night I I told my my kids and and and, and they know I'm serious. I said I've enjoyed winter, uh, but I'm ready for summer. Uh, I'm just that way. I'd move south. I'd move further south if I could. But uh, anyway, welcome. Glad you're here. We uh, are now six weeks into our Community Matters uh, sermon series. My desire, as I've said, is for this to be a culture shifting sort of a of a period of time for us, where we really become closer as a community and we really grow. Numerically, we really grow in depth as a community. That's been my, 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 my goal. Um, so I'll tell, tell you a little bit, a little bit about myself. Uh, some of you knew me, you've known me since I was a little kid, uh, a few of you. Uh, and you know, I, I grew up down here. I grew up just, a, I don't know, a mile or so away um, in Palo Verde and went to Hannah eventually, but I, I, so I grew up here. And uh, if, you, if you know me, uh, you know that I was a chubby kid. Uh, I was a chubby kid, and uh, uh, I was uh, about the about the age of ten in 1979. I kind of reached my peak of being a chubby kid, and um, and I knew I knew. I mean, I was aware of the fact that I was a chubby kid, and uh, I was I was somewhat athletic, and I, I I enjoyed sports and 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 played outdoors, but. But I had learned uh, at an early age, you know, just to be totally honest, I'd learned to turn to, to food uh, for some comfort in my life. Uh, and, and so my favorite snack in the summer of 1979 was a loaf of buttered French bread and late night TV. Um, there was no Atkins diet back then, to my knowledge. Maybe there was. I think there was, actually, but I, I hadn't heard of it. So... Um, I'm not making most of this up. Uh, I, I went, <clears throat> I went to the doctor that summer for a normal like preschool preschool year routine checkup, and maybe I don't know vaccinations or whatever. When you're ten, anyway, my mom took me to the doctor, and he commented the doctor did on my girth, and um, he he straight up asked me, son. Do you eat a lot of bread? That's what I have <laughs> And I said, no, no, doctor, I do not eat a lot of bread. My eighth grade year, uh, my eighth grade year, the weight really started coming off. And uh, for whatever reasons, uh, I started uh, looking much healthier and, and probably started living a healthier lifestyle as well. But if I'm honest, and I try to be, I still um, have this, at times, unhealthy view of myself, this, this misinformed sort of self-image. And, and it, I'm not going to um, roll out all of my baggage uh, today, but, but it, 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 it plays out in, in kind of weird ways, you know? Like sometimes how, I pretty much eat freely what I want, but sometimes there's some weirdness to how I, how I see few, food or how I view, view food or, or, you know, how I view my own self physically. It, and, 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 you know, some of you can relate and that's, that's fine. Uh, but but here's, what, here's what I wonder, and here's where we're going today. Here's what I wonder, is that a Jesus issue? Is, is, that a, is that a Jesus issue? Is that a church, a community issue? Or, or is, that, is that more of an issue where I'm supposed to just like go get private counseling but not bring it to the church because we don't really have the expertise or the time to, to deal with those sort of matters? So, so that question, like, is this something that I should admit to the church? Is this something that I, I should, those types of issues. Uh, is, this, is the church a place that we go for that kind of help? Does the church offer any hope in our, like, in our brokenness, our emotional 
brokenness, in our relational brokenness? You know, or do we sort of separate, separate out just our spiritual brokenness and say, the church is a place where we deal with spiritual brokenness, but, but any other type of uh, brokenness, you go somewhere else for that. We only specialize in spiritual brokenness. So, so I want to convince you today from, from God's Word, I want to convince you that, that, that absolutely this is a place where we should come for community care. Some call it pastoral care, but it's something that we do with and among each other. It's not just something you get from me, but it's something that, that, that plays out relationally if you have relationships in the church in many and various ways. We should be a community of hope and healing like that. So, so I asked you some, some, some questions just to get us started. Where do you go, don't, don't answer out loud, but, but where do you go when you are at your lowest? And this may have been a, a year of lows for you. And obviously the, the other question is where do you go when you're like at your highest, but things are just really hitting on eight cylinders. Where do you go? To whom do you turn? The scriptures tell us that the church is for us a place of friendship and, and family, that, that the church is a place for soul care, for community care, for, for concern for one another's physical needs and, and emotional needs and, and mental health needs and, and, and spiritual needs. Not that there aren't, not that we don't have needs for specialists in our community and, and, and outside of the church, but, but how much can we really bring to one another? What kind of care and concern should we be offering one another? You know, Miss. Uh, Miss Carrie Walker, God rest her pretty soul. Uh, Miss Carrie Walker, uh, when she was uh, just over a year ago, when she was um, in her final stages of, of, of dying from cancer, um, I really do believe that she turned to the church. And I really do believe that the church cared for her in ways that, 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 in some ways you know about, in some ways you, you don't know about. And, and that was not a perfect process. When we care for one another, it's never, it's never perfect. We make mistakes. But I think her life was a good example of really, really drilling down deep in the church, really, really coming to the church for care. So we're talking today about the church being a place of soul care. And mental and emotional and, and physical care. I want to look at this passage, Second Peter. It's a, long, it's a rather long passage, but there are really two phrases that I want us to really, really uh, cue in on. Um, I could preach for, till, th through December on, on this passage, uh, so I'm going to uh, s skip some of the the, the meat of this passage just because we simply don't have time. We'll come back. I'll preach through First Peter maybe in the next couple of years. But if you look at this passage, let's read it together. I'll read out loud and you read silently. It says, His, that is God's, His, His divine power has granted to us I want you to read this next, like, six or seven words, this next phrase. His, uh, out loud with me. His divine power has granted to us, read this, all things that pertain to life and godliness. And we'll stop there. We're going to read that again. I want you to think on that. Think on what that says. This is God's divine power has granted to us, read this, all things that pertain to life and godliness. All right, now I'll read out loud. Uh, and you can follow along silently the, 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 for the rest of it. Uh, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises. This is a really deep passage. 
so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Really, really starts unpacking what godly living looks like. Your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from, I want you to read this next phrase together with me, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so verse 8, and again, there's so much in these verses that I'm just obligated to skip uh, today because we just simply don't have time. But, but, but if you look at the beginning of this passage and the end of this passage here, for if you keep, uh, I'm sorry, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, <clears throat> they keep you from being ineffective or you could say, and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so, so at the beginning of this passage that we've read today, it says that, that God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And then, and then Peter unpacks what that looks like in a very deep and thorough and profound way. God gives us all the things that we would need for life, and for God, he gives us that. And then it says, and, and, and in God's giving us that, what we, then, uh, what we then avoid is ineffective lives and, and unfruitful lives. And so, so there's, this, there's this choice that you, ha- every one of us, we, has, we have this choice. We, we set um, a, a trajectory uh, for our lives. And I've said in weeks past that there are really two, um, two issues that you deal with in life that are profound uh, beyond any other uh, profound issues. They're like, like to the max, like the most profound issues. You decide what you're going to do with God, like how you're going to deal with, with the, 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 the ever uh, presence of God, how you're going to deal with God, and then you decide how you're going to deal with love. And that really sets a, a trajectory, a course for your life that is either, uh, that is either going to, 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 to lead to blessing or it's going to lead to, to ruin. And, and, and just, this kind of saying it just a different way. Peter is saying that, 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 that you have two choices. That God has set you up He's giving you all that you need. Uh, in God, He provides for you. In God, you can find all that you need uh, to, to, to walk this path uh, to, to life and godliness, or you discount that path. You, you choose not to take that path. The decisions you make regarding how you, uh, how you relate to God and and how you love others, and, 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 and you choose this different path, and it's a path that is, that is ineffective, and it is unfruitful. I'm deciding whether or not I should say this. Um, I've said it to a few of you in the last few weeks. I'm going to go ahead and say this. It's very, it's very, very seldom that I diverge from the text because I get myself in trouble. But I think this is safe because it's from Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, uh, from, from, from Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. I, 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 I read this quote this week. I'm going to attribute it to him. It sounds like him. He said, he says, life is, 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 it's deep and it's simple. In a sacred sense, life is deep and it's simple. And what the world has done to us, it is, it is, it is flip, it has turned that on its head. And, and, and what the world has done for us, it has, ma- it has made life shallow and complex. But in reality, life is deep and yet it's simple. And, and there's an essence to that here. And in, in, in Peter saying, God has, has given you all that you need for life and godliness. Now, now I'm going to push against a response that many of us might have to this thought. We would say, yeah, like, 
Like, God has given me all that I need for life, and we start immediately going to heaven. Like, eternal life, you know, like, yeah. Uh, uh, what God, is, God, is, God has given me a home in heaven and the pearly gates, and, and he's building for me a mansion, and he's given me life. Like, there is life in Jesus Christ. But right now, life sucks, and that's okay, like, because one day in heaven, life's going to be good. And I push against that notion. I push against that assumption that God only wants to give you life 80 or 100 years from now, or for some of us a, a lot sooner, but, but still, I, I push against the notion that that's all that God has for us. Yes, yes, in the most profound sense, God has for us eternal life, and that's, that's way more important than this, this next, you know, 40 or 50 years that I'm going to live, but, but I'm kind of interested in this 40 or 50 years being good, too. And so I push against the notion that all Peter is saying is here is that God has given you everything you need for eternal life. Because if he would have said that, he wouldn't have had to, to say life and godliness. He, would, he could have just said, God has given you all that you need for eternal life. You know, in real spiritual terms. God has given you all that you need for godliness. But he, he chooses, and in the original language, it, we're, we're being true to the original language here when we, when we use these English terms. God has given you all that you need for life and godliness. What Peter is saying here is the, the, the nitty gritty of life, what you need here, what you need now, Physically, emotionally, mentally, to live this life, to, to, to wake up tomorrow and go to work. All that you need to pay your bills, all that you need to, to relate to people that you have been broken from, that you are disenfranchised from, to, to now relate to be all that you need in life, God has given you. It's there. It's, it's, it's for you to access some of us don't access it, but it's, it's there. The point Peter is making, God is already giving me everything I need so that I don't have to live a life that is ineffective and unfruitful. I might choose to, but I don't have to. So the question that, that is begged, the question that, that immediately comes to my mind, and if you are a, an attentive listener, perhaps the question that, that immediately comes to your mind is, Okay, how do I access that? How do I get that? So, so God is committed to my current life, not, not just my eternal life, my, my current life. And he has given me all that I need for life and godliness. Another way of saying that really would be health and wholeness. And, and I say, man, I want that. Like I want to be... I want to be free of my emotional demons and my 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 mental uh, <clears throat> my mental burdens, and I, I want I, I want that. So so we have to ask God, okay, where do I find that? Where do I find health and wholeness? How do I access that? And God says, watch this. God says, in your spiritual relationships, in your friendships. In the friendships that you find uh, by living in community. Health and wholeness is inseparable from my spiritual relationships. I've been making that case for the last five weeks. So, so if, if you don't think I argue that, that case strongly enough today, go listen to the other sermons that I've preached. Um, so what happens if I find if I find few spiritual friendships? If I if I find no connection to other brothers and sisters in Christ, man, I'm dying inside. If that's the case, it's it's really hard. I believe just short of impossible to be a Christian outside of the context of the church. There's no such animal in the New Testament. A, a Christ follower who is living independently and, 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 and displaying this rugged individualism apart from the community of faith. In the New Testament, there's just no example of that sort of life. 
So it's, it's not right to assume that you can be a spiritual person and that you can, and that you can achieve uh, spiritual health um, or any sort of health apart from, um, let's just say, in isolation. First, Corinthians, First Thessalonians, rather. Um, this is the this is the uh, the end result of of the 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 the, the uh, Jewish synagogue in Thessalonica that we read about last week. Remember, they were they were they weren't they weren't the best people. Uh, they uh, Paul came and he preached three Saturday, three Sabbaths in a row, and a few of them believed, but ultimately they they kicked him out of town. They ran him out of town. The, 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 the Jewish synagogue people in, in Thessalonica, and then they, they chased him to Berea, and they roughed him up there. But, but I, I, just, I, I love, I love the, the story, the, the, the truth that, that it was all worth it. Like as a church planter myself, I love the fact that like, like I've never been run out of town, uh, but, but like even in that case, Paul, ultimately the gospel prevailed, and, and a church grew out of uh, that mess and it was the church in Thessalonica, and so this is a letter to that church. You know, he doesn't start with like, remember when you ran me out of town? He starts with, with really beautiful, beautiful language, and we come to uh, the second chapter of his first letter to the church in Thessalonica. And he says this, he says, but we were gentle among you. Hear this, hear this familial language, this, this beautiful, tender language, community sort of language in his, in his letter. We were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become very dear to us. That's the verse that I really want to um, display put on a, on, a, on a pedestal right now is, is this verse 8. We were ready to share with you not only the gospel, but our own selves. The, the New Living Translation, which is, is this really a, a, another but very accurate uh, translation of this verse, it says, we loved you so much that we shared with you not only God's good news, but our own lives also, our own lives too. We didn't just share with you the gospel, but we, we did life together. You know, the nitty-gritty, imperfect, sometimes stinky and smelly and inconvenient aspects of life. We did that together also. That's what Paul is saying. He's remembering, he's reminding the church in Thessalonica. And then it goes on. Um, this is, I'm skipping ahead now to later on in chapter 2. It says, for what is our hope? or joy, or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? And then he says, is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Paul's saying, if I'm going to, if, 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 when, when Jesus comes, I'm going to be so proud of you. I'm going to be, I'm going to be, <clears throat> I'm going to experience glory and, 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 and joy and and that, that, that tender sense of just being proud of, of the family, the family of God in this case, that, that has been built. You see, God did not save you and then offer you the option of being a part of the church. That is, that is, that is nowhere described in Scripture. That God saves you and then gives you the op- We treat church as optional, but actually it's not. The work of God has always been about a people. Yes, God saves you individually. He knows you by name. He knows the intricate nature of of who you are physically and emotionally and spiritually and mentally. He knows you individually. He knows you by name. Maybe no one else knows you by name. God knows you by name. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yet the work of God has always been about a people people whom he cherishes as his own possession, who are eager to do good works. 
we, we looked at this. Uh, some of this is just a review of what we talked about week one. It, it says, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us, that's, that's his work on the cross, his redemptive work on the cross, his substitutionary work on the cross, he substituted himself for us, and he atoned us, he redeemed us with his substitutionary work on the cross, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, lawlessness and to purify for himself, what? A people for his own possession, who are zealous to do good works. It says the same thing in 1 Peter 2. It says the same thing several places in Scripture that, that, that God has, has always been about. A people gathering to himself a people whom he cherishes, whom he possesses, uh, a people who are eager to do his works. Now, now what, are the, what are the biggest hurdles to us uh, becoming a community of faith. Not just people who come on Sundays, but actually becoming a community of faith. And I think there are two hurdles. Uh, briefly, the two hurdles that I think are hard for, for you and me to clear in, in becoming, like really drilling down deep, really becoming a family of God. One is, it's a big word, a a homogeneous lifestyle that, that most of us um, aspire to. That means nothing, right? Let me, let, me, let, me, let me unpack that a little bit. You know how when you get your milk and it's homogenized? You, you know, you know, remember that word? Right? What that means is, I had, to, I had, to, I had to, to go back and restudy this. It means that when you, when you get your milk, it's all the same, top to bottom, left to right. Every it's it 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 the the cream doesn't the cream no longer separates from the milk, the fats and the solids and it, like because nobody likes that, right? That's that's yucky, right? Except for those of you that that grew up drinking milk straight out of the cow, and you know how beautiful that is. But like we like our milk homogenized, you know, or. Uh, like we get this peanut butter that the like the fat rises and the, the the other part stays down and people don't really like that they like it all the same and 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 that's how many of us we we live our lives we just want to be around people that are just like us and folks that's not the church that's a club you can go you can go to a you, <laughs> You can find a church where there are enough people in the pews that then maybe you can find your own little group of people that are just like you. But that's not the church. I think that, 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 that one of the reasons that we don't jump in with all of our being and say, I'm making this, like, this is my community of faith, because we tend toward this homogeneous, wanting to just be around people that are like me. You know, in your biological family, man, like, like, like if, if we're, if we're really honest, like really honest, like, like your brothers and sisters, like they would never be your friends in real life, except that like, you, you know, when all of you die, the last person gets all the stuff. So your family, so you, th those are the people you gravitate to, not because they're just like you, in some ways, they annoy the heck out of you. They're nothing like you, but they're family. Church is, is like that. It's intended to be. Second uh, real hurdle that we have to clear if we're going to really be a community of faith is, is this rugged individualism. In culture, uh, we worship individualism. In, in culture, we hold up is this sort of highest ethic, individual rights and our own personal desires. Like that's like, that's like sacred stuff in the culture that we live in. It's no wonder. It's no wonder that the challenge of bringing two individuals uh, together in a relationship, is, is, it, it's a hard road long term. 
Now think about bringing dozens and dozens of people together and, and saying, now we're going we're gonna to relate to one another long term for the rest of our lives. We're in this. It's, it, it seems impossible because we live in a culture of such rugged individualism. And uh, the church is a mystery to me because it, how it can survive, how the church can survive in, in the culture I'm not talking about sin and licentiousness. And, and I'm talking about just the, the, the self-worship, just the culture in which we just so love the self, the individual, how the church survives in that. It's a mystery, but, but she does. She presses on. She survives. I, I, I showed you some diagrams uh, week one uh, of this sermon series and I want to I want to revisit them because they're quite relevant. Um, this is how th this diagram number one it, it it diagrams how most of us live our, our lives really, and that is that that I'm an individual, I'm an island, and I have responsibilities that I juggle, and um, you know it's my work and my finances and my home and my my sacred screen time. And my finances, that's study. The one over there is, if you're a student, study. The one on this side is my finances. And I juggle those, but I drop them. I drop them from time to time. Life gets hard, and, and I, drop, um, I drop church. Um, maybe, maybe I have to work extra. Uh, maybe I have to work extra because I got to pay off my, my crazy credit card bill, and so church just has to, to drop. And th this is not me uh, um, chewing on your tail because you haven't been to church lately. It's not about that at all. But, but it, it is about how we see ourselves as individuals as opposed to uh, another diagram, which I think is really a, a New Testament picture. And that is, yeah, I'm an individual, but I'm an individual that is a part of a community of faith. And so everything that I have going on in my life is informed by my my friendships, by, by the community. It, there's, there's an incredible amount of submission that goes on here. I'm not talking about submission to the church like the elders are going to come to your home and, and, and tell you what to do. I'm talking about in your own relationships, in your own small group, in your own Wednesday night table group that we do around here. There's this incredible submission where you have to like come clean. You have to say, like, this is what's going on in my life, and, and because of this, uh, I'm having trouble with this uh, because of my 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 school dad, I'm having trouble with my finances, which means that they turned off my cell phone, and now my, my wife's angry because we don't have social media anymore, and therefore we don't come to church anymore. Like, it all relates, right? And so, uh, so within this diagram, we, we live these submissive lives in which we inform and we speak into one of those lives. Would anybody care to admit I'm I am considering a decision right now that I would rather uh, not give anybody any authority over in my life. I'd rather just make it on my own. Like That's probably most of us. Um, and so, so if we're going to push against this rugged individualism, and we're going to be a community of faith, then we're going to bring to one another issues like credit card debt. Which, which is, is, is turned many of your lives upside down. You're like, well, I'm supposed to go to Financial Peace University. I'm supposed to go outside, like listen to a radio program for that. I'm suggesting that, 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 that maybe this life and godliness that God has provided for means that we bring it to the church, that we do life together. Sickness in your own life. Dysfunction shame, rather than taking that into, uh, rather than dealing with that as though it's a private matter, I'd rather you not know about, what if we, as a community of faith, brought that to one another? And I've heard the thought, well, uh, uh, ain't nobody else here doing any better than me, so, so who's going to give me counsel? Like, I, that's not the point. The, the, the point is that God has brought us together as a community of faith, that God has brought us together 
to, to live in community. It's not, it's, not, it's not because one of us is an expert, and we can, but, but together we can do this life. At the center of this diagram um, is, is me as a member of a community of faith. See, we, we are made, we've always been made to live in community. From the beginning, uh, day one, or from the beginning, uh, God said, let us, let us make man in our image. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit working together in submission, in, 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 in involuntary submission, in tandem. And, and God has made us that way, that we might live in tandem, that we might live in this voluntary, voluntarily submissive sort of state together. I want to I want to invite a friend up. You, you, um, some of you know him, but John Masso. If you come up here, we're gonna we're gonna do a little interview and talk a little bit more about this matter, and then we'll run run to the table of communion, which is always the place we should run when we feel insufficient. Awesome man. I'm going to give you that. Good morning, everybody. John Masso. Several of you have gotten to know him, and, and, and more of you ought to. Uh, I got some questions. We, we talked about these uh, ahead of time, so they're not, it's not a. It's not a terribly big surprise what I'm asking, but 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 John, would you tell uh, tell our friends here when did you uh, and and Janie and and your son Brandon when when did you all start coming to River Church? The first time we came was on Easter Sunday of this year. On Easter Sunday, I remember that day well. I remember you coming up to me, and there was this resolve in your eyes, and you're like, "We're we're coming back." For sure. And everybody tells me that. But but you, I could see it. I could see it in your eyes. Like, he's serious, man. He's serious. Um, and and just a little a little uh, uh, bit of information. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. You have been here every Sunday since Easter Sunday. No one in this room, because I, I pay close to, including me, no one in this room, including me, has been here every Sunday since Easter, except for the Muscles, except for John Muscle. That's correct. <laughs> See, I told you. It's crazy. Um, why did you come to the river? Um, we were looking for a new home church, basically. Yeah, yeah. And what were you and your family looking for at River Church? Just a better understanding of the Bible and... Uh, you know, a better way of living through Christ. When you came here uh, to the river, what did you find here? Um, a sense of peace, I guess, and um, better communication with God and the Holy Spirit. Um, just a sense of peace overall. I only told John what I'm about to tell him. I only told him this uh, like 30 minutes ago. He didn't know I was going to say this when I asked him if he if he would do an interview, but but he um, he uh, someone someone came to River Church recently, like in the last few uh, weeks, and and told me uh, said yeah I said why are you here they said I uh, a friend of mine uh, knows Maso called you Maso and uh, told me that he was coming to River Church and. Uh, Good things are happening in, in Maso's life, like the like changes and like really serious spiritual stuff. And so I wanted to come here too. I, that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful testimony, my friend. For sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, have you made friends since coming to, to the river? I've uh, gotten to know quite a few people since coming to River Church, and we're obviously working on getting to meet everybody and know everybody a little bit better. Yeah. You've been coming on Wednesday nights to our our, uh, our our community nights. As well, yes. Yeah. I remember 
uh, for for months because, like I said, it's since been been since Easter. You and and Janie would come every week, and you'd sit there and and hi Janie, where are you, Janie? Where's Janie? Hi, Jean. Um, and you, you two are kind of like uh, Lydia and I. You're kind of qu- you're kind of quiet. You're not, you know, you're not the the loudest mouth in the room. I mean, I'm the loudest mouth in the room, you know, f- during the sermon. But other than that, we're kind of quiet. And you're kind of quiet. And so I was I was a little bit, a little bit concerned. Like, you all gonna make friends? You're gonna you're gonna develop community. But but you've made this choice to come to community night. On Wednesday nights, and, and and I've seen you right over here at that that table making friends. We we have come every Wednesday night, and we've really enjoyed ourselves getting to meet a lot of you, and uh, hopefully get to meet a lot more of you as well. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. What we're talking about today is community care. Um, I, I want this to, to, to mark us. I want us to be a people who, who walk this pathway together, um, this pathway to health and wholeness. I, I don't want to be j- just a place where, uh, where, we, where we have our spiritual needs met, as awesome as that is. I want to I be a, a place of health and wholeness across the board. Um, it's to that end that I that I lead you. Let us pray.